Look at these girls go. Flying into the hive with their bright orange pollen bags. Collecting their loads of nectar. They can carry almost their own body weight back from the flowers into the hive. They're absolutely extraordinary little creatures. Monday was World Bee Day, so today we're going to talk and have a discussion about what we can do to help our pollinators. So if you're tuning in, please put some comments below, any questions you have, and also any ideas you have to help our little pollinators. And not only these European honeybees, but also the other over 19,000 species of, of bees that we have around the world. So there's so many things that you can do, even in your backyard, like letting, letting things go wild, letting patches of your yard, if you, if you designate an area and just let it, let it go to flower, like even weeds like this, when they flower, provide forage for bees and, and especially those 19,000 species that actually don't have a very big range. Honeybees can forage something like 10 kilometers if they're hungry, but the other bee species, it's much shorter. They might only travel a few hundred meters. So having forage, even in your suburban backyard, allows stepping stones across the urban landscape for our pollinators. Monday was World Bee Day. For those that are just tuning in, we're having a discussion today about what we can do to help our pollinators. So if you have any suggestions, please put them in the comments below. Often good ideas come out of the blue. So if you've got a good idea, put it in the comments below. Also, if you've got questions about uh, honeybees and pollinators in general, we'll answer them. You can see them coming in with their, their orange pollen here. It's amazing. It really is a, a beautiful sight to watch as the bees fly home with their loads of pollen and nectar. Nectar's their, their carbohydrate and pollen is their protein. But they don't just eat the pollen, they actually put it in the cells and ferment it into bee bread in order to partly digest it. They have such a complex uh, society. It's almost they work as one large organism that can spread out over a 10 kilometer range and bring that nectar, that pollen, right back into your hive. And the amazing thing is they also make enough honey for us to have some too. It's a beautiful symbiotic relationship that goes way, way back where, where now we are so intertwined with these honeybees that we actually are in trouble without them. What we're gonna do is pop the lid and also answer any questions you have or any suggestions you have to help our bees and our pollinators of the world. It's so fantastic that bees are on the agenda. And things like World Bee Day, it's, a, um, it's an important milestone in history that humans are really seeing the importance for bees. Because when we look after our bees, we also look after our world because what bees need is biodiversity, an ecosystem. Just like us, if you, if you eat one form of protein, which is their pollen, then you'll get sick. So they need, they need a good variety and beekeepers know that. If you go and put your hives on canola, you can't leave them there, there for, for too long or they get sick. You have to then move them to where there's, there's an abundance of different flowers, an abundance of, of different pollens for them to really get into and, and to stay healthy. I'm just going to pop this uh, bee bale on. And then we're gonna open up the hive and, and really have a look at what's going on. A beautiful sunny day like this is the perfect time to open up your hive. Get the smoker going again. Often if you've been standing around, it goes out a little bit. Okay. Just going to add a little bit of smoke into the entrance. Doesn't need too much. This is a small hive. It doesn't have a, a super on it yet. And then you can leave the smoke near the entrance for the bees to, to smell that. It helps to calm them down. And just uh, 
Noticing that there's a little bit of wobble in this hive, so I'm going to adjust the foot. Stabilise it up. And pop the lid off. If the inner cover is right on top of your brood nest, then it's a good idea to have a look for the queen in case she's on the inner cover. It's surprising how many times you find her right here. You don't want to orphan her from the hive because she can't fly when she's in egg laying mode. She's too heavy. So when the bees go to swarm, they actually starve her so she's light enough to fly. Any questions or comments or if you've, if you've got ideas on, on how we can help our pollinators and help protect them from uh, the 19,000 bee species in the world, 10% of them are actually on the brink of extinction. So it's really important work we do and you can do it in your own backyard. Cedar Sammy is asking, are there any plants or flowers that you should avoid around your hives? Okay, that's a really interesting question. If anybody has any answers to that, put it in the comments below. The, um, in my area, there isn't any flowers we should avoid. Now, in other countries, there is, there is a plant in, in New Zealand that actually can create poisonous honey. So, in some parts of the world, yes, there is things that would be, um, would be better to avoid. But uh, here, any flowering plant is a good thing. And I think that is the case for many parts of the world as well. I'm just going to add a little bit of smoke here where I'm going to work so I don't squash any bees as I pull up one of these frames. You notice the bees clear away and I would too if someone was blowing a smoker at me. Then it's a case of getting your tool and just levering the frame sideways and then we can look in at the fascinating world of bees and see how they're going, what they're up to. Just loosening up that frame. And I'm just going to pull that up nice and slowly. The first one's always a little bit more tricky because the spacing is tight. Okay, I've just lifted that frame. Let's have a look what's going on. So that one is actually mostly honey. You can see the capping there. They have used it for brood, but they've filled it in with honey. On the other side, we've also got honey. So that's a beautiful example of naturally drawn comb. We've just let the bees hang that comb from the, from the uh, comb guide which inserts into the top of the frame and what an amazing structure they create. It's amazing how the cell sizes vary and even the cell orientation. Sometimes they've got the flats to the top and other times they've got the points to the top. You can see this beautiful orange pollen just here on this bee. Right on their pollen baskets. So they actually have hairs all over their body and they use a static charge to help collect the pollen and they scrape it all back and collect it on their pollen baskets on their hind legs and then fly that back to the hive. Any questions or comments put it in the in, in the section below and we'll get to answering them. If you've got any ideas on how we can help protect our pollinators, also put them in the, in the comment section as well. Cedar Victor has three flow hives and he's wondering how long will it take for the bees to move up into the flow super? Okay, the answer is it really varies because you get situations where you've got a really strong colony. Let's say you've shaken a really big swarm into your hive. You've got a really strong colony that can fill that all out in a week and then move straight up into the top box. The most extreme I've seen it is, is they've already filled the top box in a week. But conversely, you can have months and months and months where there's not enough flowers or the colony's not strong enough and it can be really 
slow and sometimes you might not even get honey that season so so it really does depend if you want to speed it up a little bit we've got tips and tricks on how to do that by by getting a bit of burr comb from your bottom box and rubbing it into the flow frame face and the bees will then go this isn't supposed to be here and start moving it around on the comb and connecting all the pieces together so if you're getting impatient you can do that you'll also find that one hive will be rem remarkably different to the next hive sometimes you've got two hives that were started at the same time side by side and one's just wow filling it all with honey and the other is really slow so great you've got got a few hives there and you should really notice that difference and how often would you need to check for varroa mite okay varroa mites a, a good question and it depends on what strategy you're using now here in Australia we don't have the varroa mites so the best answers you're going to get are from your local beekeepers now during the honey season some people are expecting every, every couple of weeks making sure the mite levels are at a level that aren't going to be detrimental to your hive and some people are, are treating a lot others are using what's called survivor bees where the, the, the genetics of the hive are such that they can handle the varroa, varroa mite themselves the weaver family in the USA has, has been breeding bees to handle the varroa mite so it depends on your genetics and, and what treatment strategy for varroa if you're in Australia here we don't have to worry about that one Robin would like to know, are predators a problem? Okay, so predators can be a problem. The reason why we put this stand on, on the hive is because there are predators, ground dwelling tr predators. We have a, a, an introduced toad called the cane toad here. It was brought in to control the cane beetle in sugarcane and it's now become a widespread pest and it'll knock on the hives at night, wait for the bees to come out and then eat the bees. And once I even opened up the, uh, the hive, and um, a hive that wasn't doing so well, and there was a cane toad inside it that, that could never get out again because it had gotten so big in there eating bees that it would never get out the entrance. So the poor bees had to fly in and come past this monster with a big tongue in order to get up to the hive. And no wonder it wasn't doing so well. So for that reason, it's good to lift your hives up a bit. Now, we also have water dragons. They'll eat a few bees, but not, so, not such an issue. We also have pheasants, not such an is issue. The rainbow bee eaters eat bees, but they're not such an issue as well. So it really depends. Uh, sometimes I think fair's fair. If you've got things in your local environment that eat a few bees, then, then that's okay. But if they're, if they're eating a lot of bees like the cane toads, then it's good to use a strategy to get your hive up. Other areas, like in the US, we have the skunks that'll, um, that'll come up, I'll eat bees, and then they'll get stung, and they'll do this kind of roll across the lawn as, as they deal with the stings on the nose, and then come back again for more. So, so if anyone's got entertaining footage of that, I'd love to see it. So pests, uh, so predators can be an issue, but generally, generally not too much. So this is quite interesting here. We've got a queen cell with a queen in it so straight away i'm seeing this long um long cell here hanging down off the comb and noticing that it's closed at the end so this hive is about to raise a new queen and it's possible that they've superseded their queen or the queen's died for some reason you can still see brood here so what i'm going to have a look at now is whether there's eggs or young larvae down the cells and whether there is a laying queen currently in the hive if there's not they will make one pretty soon by the look of it um, if I swap over to this to this other side I'm seeing patchy brood so so um, again looking down the cells and I can't see bee eggs so it looks like they've lost their queen recently and I can't see um, any sign of young larvae. So the, the capped brood there is actually what they're gonna need to replace their worker bees because the worker bees may only live for, um, for, for three to six weeks, depending on how hard they're foraging. So they'll need to, to, to be quick to raise a new queen. Now, the queen in here has, has um, been fed royal jelly for the entire 
a part of her life, which um, and not feeding her the plant proteins from from the pollen means that genetically she turns into a queen. So it's actually lo lack of the plant proteins, or, or, or the constituents in the in the pollen, which means she will then be supersized into a into a bee with large ovaries ready to to go about a long life up to six years of laying a few thousand eggs a day. It's extraordinary. And here you can see the male bees right in this area with their big eyes. You can see just at the tip of the tool they've got much bigger eyes and a bigger body. People when they're starting often mistake them for queens but the queen looks quite different. She's more like a elongated worker with bigger legs. So I don't think we're going to see a queen today. Looks like they currently are queenless, but they're, they're quite on to replacing that queen. So that's good news. Lane would like to know what kind of bee works best in a flow hive? So the European honey bee is the, is the one that, that um, most people are using, although there's, there's Apis japonica and, and there's, uh, there's a few different species around the world in Japan and in Asia where, where um, they are actually a different species of bee and it still does work in the flow hive but there's a size change. So our Japanese friends are making flow hives that are, that are about this long with the flow frames and, and a tall little hive like this and then it works. But all of the Apis uh, mellifera hit which um, includes uh, the Italian bees, the, can the Carnolians, the, um, the, the, the many varieties you can get from, from a bee breeder, the Caucasians, um, all work perfectly with the flow frames. So pretty much any of the honeybees you can get from a bee breeder. I'm just going to pry apart this next frame here. Being careful not to damage that queen cell. and putting my tool here. Again, if you've got any questions or comments about how we can help our bees, put them in the comments below. It's interesting to think about, like even your choice as a consumer has a profound impact. If you buy a bag of organic muesli or granola, then that's thousands or even millions of flowers that were pollinated to go into that bag of, of, of granola. And and when you choose to buy organic, that's thousands or millions of flowers that weren't sprayed with insecticide. So there's this amazing flow on effect simply from your buying choice. And when you do that, you also support organic farmers who, who are actively doing things in a different way in order to best support our ecosystems. So that's one way you can help every day. Any comments, put them in the questions below. Any ideas to help support our pollinators would be most welcome. Khaled says GMO and pesticides are killing our bees. Um, do you want to speak on that? It is true. It doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to work out if you spray insecticides onto flowers, you'll kill insects like the pollinating insects. At the moment, it's something like over a billion litres of insecticide sprayed each year on our precious planet. Now, that is an issue. That is a real issue, not only for the honeybees, but all of the other insects on, on our globe. There's been rep reports coming back from, from Europe saying 90% of insects have disappeared. Now, that is huge, and it is huge news that we can have such catastrophic losses on such a big global scale. So humans really do need to change their ways. And we as consumers need to change what we buy. If you go and buy the cheapest stuff from the supermarket, you're often supporting a, a type of farming that is actively damaging to, to our pollinators, to our insects, to our environment. And you are taking a part of that. It's such a simple thing you can do is support the movement back to organic. It was organic for 
for, for thousands of years and it's only in the recent history that have changed these practices that are having a profound effect on our honeybees and pollinators. You can also do things right in your backyard just by letting places go wild, putting the sprays away, coming up with alternatives and, and making sure that, that your garden is a safe haven for pollinators because that creates a safe stepping stone across the urban landscape for, for honeybees and especially the 19,000 bee species, the native bees in the world who have a much smaller range, often only foraging maybe 200 metres. So, so when you do that, it's just a little bit more reach that those species and 10% of them are on the brink of extinction can survive and, and propagate through the urban landscape. Any more questions or comments? Victor's hive is new. Should he put the super on straight away or wait until his colony is stronger? I would say wait until your colony is stronger and they've, they've finished building out all of your brood frames. Reason being is you don't want to be in a, in a um, situation, if you've got still got cold nights and things, you want the hive to rough, roughly be the right size for your bees. You don't want a massive area for them to patrol. It just makes it harder when you get pests such as the, the small hive beetle and so on. So, so let your bees build up to there's plenty of bees like this in the box and then put your super on. Another reason is, is um, what you'll find is things will be very slow if you put the super on and you'll get impatient waiting for action in the flow frames. If the bees are busy and bustling like this, they'll move up and start working those frames much quicker, which is just a nicer experience. Cedar Peter lost their colony recently. Um, would the continual rain that they are getting in North Queensland have an effect on their once healthy hive? Black beetle and wax moth were evident. Um, they're now starting again and how can they avoid this situation from occurring again? Okay, um, generally bees in this environment can, can survive the rain. They even forage in light rain. So it's more likely to be a secondary issue with like this hive, it lost its queen, but perhaps they didn't get it together to make another one. And in that case, you get the, the small hive beetle taking over and, and other pests, and that causes the, the final loss of your colony. If you, can, if you can get ahead of it and notice that they've lost their queen, then you can introduce one and keep them going. But if it's too late for that, then you will have to start again with another colony. So I'd say that's probably most likely what happened. There's also other, other disease issues that can be prominent. It'd be good to have a good look at that to make sure there's no AFB down the cells. Have a good look, see if there's any snail trails looking, looking things down, down the cells. And you can send a sample off to the lab. It's free in order to, uh, to check um, whether there's any, any disease issues before you set about putting another colony in, in that hive. Um, so, sorry to hear that. Hopefully you um, get going again in, in, um, in spring and your next colony thrives. Okay, here we've got patchy brood again and no new brood laying. So interesting, the moment I looked in this hive, oh, and another queen cell that's cup. So they're raising two queens just to make sure. You can see it just here. It doesn't look quite as big and healthy as the other one. But there it is there, that, that um, elongated cell hanging down has a queen in it. Shorter, shorter uh, cocoon time, the, the, the raising a queen is 16 days versus 21 for your worker bees over here that you can see. So they're able to, to get a jump on it. Then it might be a couple of weeks depending on the weather till she's mated and ready to be laying eggs around the hive and then the cycle continues. So what we should expect to see here is a drop in bee numbers. During that time we're going to make sure this, the small hive beetles don't take over and then once the new queen's laying we should expect it to pick up again and, and um, the colony to, to thrive from there. Any more questions? Ryan would like to know is hydroponics considered organic? 
Uh, that's a great question. If anybody's got the answer to that, put it in the comments below. There, um, there probably is some versions of it, but I believe um, hydroponics generally isn't um, organic because they're feeding a, a chemical solution to the roots of the plants. Um, Aaron's in the western suburbs of Sydney and his brood box is packed with bees. Should he put his flow super on when they're coming into winter? Um, if they're packed with bees, then I would. Sometimes um, you get quite good flows in the winter in this subtropical kind of region. So you may be lucky to, to get that and the, and the bees can start on the frames. Now, as long as you've got a really bustling um, hive here, and if, if you're further south in Victoria, then I probably wouldn't. But in these kind of warmer areas, then we hardly get a winter here as far as the honeybees are concerned. <laughs> There, um, this is like a, the winter here is almost like a summer's day where, where the European honeybees are from. Oren's asking, how do bees produce royal jelly? Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. If anyone's got the answer, put it in the comments below. I believe they, the, um, the worker bees secrete the, um, the royal jelly and, and then it's fed to the, uh, the young larvae. And Andrew is wondering what happens if there are two queens? So two virgin queens in the hive usually don't fight but when you get in a situation where there is a queen in the hive and there's one another queen getting raised they will actually fight to the death. So Generally, a hive will have one queen in it. However, I've certainly seen two queens in a hive before. So there's no rule of thumb. The uh, colony is individual. They have their own personality almost. This one's quite a friendly hive. Probably don't even need a bee suit to work this one. Um, however, that's all about to change with the new queens being raised. The genetics will be different. So, so we will expect to the, the temperament of the bees to change. And not only that, you get um, situations where bees, uh, queen bees won't lay in flow frames. I've got a hive right outside my door where I don't need an excluder because she never will lay in the flow frames. But then I've, I've seen a situation before where I've had a hive like that and I happened to be there when the bees dragged out the queen, they raised another one, the new queen was quite happy to lay in the flow frames. So they have different things they will do and won't do and that's largely dependent on the genetics the queen has and that she's, she's collected um, a lot of that genetics from the drones from her mating flight. Lee's wondering are you going to release an internal sugar feeder for the flow hive? An internal sugar feeder. So um, it's a good idea we'll certainly put it on the on the road map. We don't need to feed bees around here but, but um, there certainly would be good for some of our southern customers here and the northern customers in the northern hemisphere where you get a long cold winter and sometimes you really need to feed them up to make sure they have enough stores. Okay. If I go one this way, I've probably mostly got honey now. Considering the center is generally where they're laying their babies and the outer edges is where they tend to store honey. Okay, I'm just lifting another frame out. Just being very careful where I put my fingers. If you're new to beekeeping, wear your gloves until you really get used to what's going on. And try not to put your finger on the bee when you start to experiment with not wearing gloves. Okay. So what's really interesting about this frame is really different cell sizes on it. From my eye of, of studying bees over, over years and looking at the honey, where they're putting these honey frames, we've got cells 
up to 6.5 millimetres, which is amazing. And that's why we went for a larger cell size with the flow frames, is when they're storing honey, purposefully made for honey, they tend to go for a larger size. Whereas when they're, they're multi-purpose using a cell for brood and honey, they'll stick to around 5.3 millimetres, which is more like these cells over here. That's a typical size worker bee cell that they're laying, laying workers in. And this over here, they would lay drones in it, but they wouldn't lay workers in this larger cell size area. Okay. We've got um, time for a couple more questions. Kenneth is asking, do you recommend rolling hot beeswax on your flow supers before placing them in? I don't recommend rolling hot beeswax, but you're welcome to try. Now, if you've got a short honey season, let's say you're in a cold area and your season is compressed into, say, three, three months or, or a couple of months, then you might not want to take any chances and you, want, you might want to give them the best shot by, by putting some hot wax onto the frames. You can paint it on with a paintbrush and that will get the bees going a little bit quicker. Before I would bother with that, I would just get some, some wax from around your brood nest and just mash it into the flow frame surface. The bees will quickly realise it's in the wrong spot and start chewing it away and recycle that onto the comb in that area. Here, we don't need to put anything on the frames. We've got strong colonies, we've got, we've got nectar flows and the bees just move right in and start working the frames. However, if you want to speed it up, putting some wax on them can help. Um, Ross says, so what you're saying is that the temperament of the hive can change even with a new queen from, even with a new queen from the old queen. My current colony is very grumpy. Yeah, if you get a grumpy colony, what's, what's pr probably, if it was calm and then it turned grumpy, then what's almost definitely happened is they've lost their queen, they're either grumpy because they've lost their queen <laughs> or they've raised a new one and the genetics are such that they're more aggressive in nature. Now aggressive bees are just not so nice to, to work, to, to pull apart and look at, but they can be great at, at uh, collecting honey, they can be great at keeping pests away. So I've certainly got lots of aggressive hives as well and it's quite interesting if you want to turn them into a, a calm colony then what you'll need to do is get in there take the old queen away and put in a new one you can order queen bees in the mail and they come in a little capsule with about five escort bees you then put them into your hive once you've taken the old one away usually waiting a, a day for the, the hive to realize they don't have a queen and then you put the new one in and then that new genetics about um, three or four weeks later will be in your hive and that whole temperament will change. So is there something that we can do today to help our pollinators, like some simple act? There's many simple acts to help our pollinators. One is just letting spaces of your yard grow wild, letting things flower, letting your garden go to seed putting away the sprays, turning your neighbourhood into an insecticide free zone, creating habitat just by piling up mulch. Mud is good for the blue banded bee here and, and also other native bee species. So allowing areas and habitat in your yard then creates stepping stones across the urban landscape. Choosing to, to eat organic food is a big one. The flow on effect of that is profound. Literally a, a, a bag of, of muesli or granola would be, would be thousands or millions of flowers that the bees have visited to, to create all of those almonds and all of those nuts and, and, and so on. So, so uh, the, the choice of buying organic then supports organic agriculture, which then supports our pollinators of not only the European honeybees, but all sorts of other native ones in the area. More questions? Um, Jenny's a new beekeeper and she's wondering what kind of wax should she buy to paint over the flow frames? 
okay. as she doesn't have any other wax available. Okay, if you do want to put wax on your flow frames, the first place I'd recommend is getting it from your brood box. That way you're not introducing any foreign wax into your hive. So scraping off a bit of, bit of wax like this and just mashing it into the flow frames. You see it builds up on the combs like this. You scrape it all off and mash it in. If you want to go a step further and put some wax on, make sure it's sterilized wax. So if you buy foundation sheets, for instance, from a bee store, then you'd hope that, that it's nice and sterilized and free from, from any AFB spores, etc. Sammy would like to know how much space do you need to use a flow hive? So you don't need much space to use a flow hive at all. There's people in the city now keeping bees on their rooftops. There's people in their, in their small backyards. It's more about being mindful about the flight path of the bees. Here we've got a fence really close by, so the bees are kind of flying out and having to double back. And you see the flight path is actually through here. So it's about thinking about where the bees are going to find their, their flight path and making sure that's not where people commonly walk, etc. So make sure it's not pointing at the neighbor's path and, and uh, so situating it in a way that it is going to be um, supportive to, to other people nearby. Thank you very much for tuning in and uh, tune in again next week. We'll have something interesting to show you.